show. I think we have just seen some acapella history being made, John. And from an all-female group, Gail, oh. I could never have called this one. Never. Well, you are a misogynist <laughs> at heart, so there's no way you would have bet on these girls Absolutely. to win. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hollywood Gold. I'm your host, Daniela taplin Lundberg, and I'm here with my right-hand woman, Becca Camerata. Hey, Bex. Hey, how are you? I'm great. So, what are we talking about today? We are talking about a film that is, to be honest, one of my all-time favorites. Ooh. It's probably the only film that we've done that I did not need to rewatch before we... <laughs> Did this interview, yep. but I did anyway last night because I was not going to pass up an opportunity to rewatch it, even though I do at least twice a year. I know. I watched it this weekend, too. It's so good. It's so um, good. It is a film called Pitch Perfect. Such a fun film. And my dear friends, Max Handelman and Elizabeth Banks, produced it. And I take great pride in them producing because 20 years ago when we first became friends and we were all young whippersnappers in the business, I remember... We did a movie, Elizabeth and I did a movie together called The Baxter, and they asked me about producing, and they sort of had cooked up this idea, their husband and wife, that they were going to start producing and sort of taking things into their own hands. So I sent them an option agreement, which is what you need to option material. I introduced them to a line producer, who I'll never forget, Karen Jaranesky, and look at them now. They've leapfrogged me. (laughs) Bex, <laughs> they're way more successful than I am, but um, I wouldn't say that. No, I wouldn't say no, that. But can. I would say it's that okay. there <laughs> there is a pattern here where you have mentored and you have guided and and given advice to a lot of a lot of people who have gone on to have really amazing producing careers, and so I think that says a great deal about who you are as a kind and generous mentor. Thanks, Bex. That's and a great spin. But but <laughs> I well because they all they all still are in your life. They're no, all friends. They are. And they all- they're they're our dearest friends, and we spend a lot of holidays with them. And so I'm so excited to get into the nitty gritty of this movie because it's such an iconic film. It's 10 years old now. It has spawned a major franchise, and so I just want to understand where it all started for them and how they built it. So let's get going. So today we're going to do a deep dive, like deep, deep dive into Pitch Perfect, which is one of the most incredible, successful franchises that you guys produced and came up with and made happen. So start from the beginning and I'll pepper you with questions. Max wrote a very unsuccessful book. (laughs) <laughs> Let's, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't that unsuccessful. It was well, a typical. It was book. before its time. It got published. Tell us it the title published. so we can like promote that a little bit. Uh, it was called "Why Fantasy Football Matters and Our Lives Do Not." That's okay, right. uh huh. It was a. It, it was, was actually the basis kind of for that show, The League, back in the day. Yeah. Oh yeah, I love that show. So, despite the fact that mostly that was read by friends and family, that uh, <laughs> led Max to a meeting with his book agent in New York, who said, "I just read." a book proposal about acapella singing. Mm-hmm. Do you want to look at it? <laughs> mm-hmm. I was, yeah, my then book agent, uh, this guy, Bird Level, Bird at one point called me and said, this colleague of mine got this book proposal. I don't know what it is. It sounds kind of ridiculous, but maybe it'll appeal to you. It's about the world of acapella. Like you remember those nerds from uh, college, right? Because you know, mm-hmm. he's like, UVA, yeah, dude. And UVA <laughs> had, they had have, a they really have... big time acapella sure. community. Yeah. And I said, yeah. So it was a book proposal, which is, for those who don't know, authors who are attempting to sell their books for option before they're written, which is also not that common, you would write a book proposal. We did it for our book. And it's like a couple sample chapters and Mm -hmm. an outline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you lay out what the book is and what the market is for, who the audience is. And then, yeah, it's usually somewhere in the world of four to six chapters. Mm -hmm. So that's what I got. I got like the first six chapters of this book, Pitch Perfect, and written by Mickey Rapkin, Rapkin, who at the time was a pretty big time journalist at GQ. GQ, GQ. yeah. Mm -hmm. He had had profiled me. Yeah, he covered the celebrity beat at Mm -hmm. GQ, and and, and Mickey's become a very good friend, and, and so that's another benefit of this whole experience. But um, I came home, I basically read the six chapters, and it doesn't take very long, and Elizabeth and I went to Penn 
which is a big a cappella community. Mickey went to he went to Cornell, Cornell, and, and sang in their group. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He he's all in. Like he still is a, a total. Yeah, he sings. Believer, sings he sings in a choir right now for sure. <laughs> you know, we knew what a cappella was. You know, oh. a lot of people know Pitch Perfect today. Are like, oh yeah, a cappella. Like that, that's become a huge thing. But before Pitch Perfect, a cappella was not what it is today. It was mm-hmm. not remotely cool. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's cool yet. Well, but, right. Speak but, for yourself. <laughs> no, I mean. But I mean, it was definitely for those. It of was us, niche. Yeah, for those of us who went, you know, it was a very, very college specific. It was collegiate. Thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was, you know, it was Glee clubs. It was mm-hmm. like what came out of Glee club. Right? But it was. So. Um, it was right around this time that like Superbad came out. The whole kind of geek chic. Dodgeball was like one of our touch points. Yeah. We were like, uh-huh. oh, they Come. took like a niche thing, right? Right. And you know, and they did it really seriously, and but like also, that's what we could do with yeah. this. And Judd was. That whole wave when Judd was just killing it mm-hmm. uh, with forty old virgin and yeah, yeah, old virgin knocked up and was Glee was the show Glee? No, no, no. that wasn't that, even oh, happening yet. This was. Oh my uh, god! Well, we have a funny story about that yeah, because so, we <laughs> so yes, yeah, so we find this book and and we can we'll come back to that. Okay, like, circle back. Don't forget that. Yeah, so we get this opportunity to appeal to this author, Mickey Rapkin to uh, basically have a shopping agreement, yeah. which is, it, it's typically a non-transactional arrangement or agreement where you are given the right to shop a piece of material the idea. For, a, mm-hmm. for a limited period of time. You don't lock it up for a long time. And we and, didn't get the whole town. Yes. He had so, other mm, producers interested yeah. mm. so that UTA, took other places. And it turned out that because we were interested in it, UTA then went out and kind of represented the author, which also happens agents do this you know right like, oh producers we represent are interested in this we better go <laughs> sign up the author what did you guys get like what territories did you get with the we shopping got half, half. Um, we got okay. like un- we definitely got universal got, obviously yeah mm-hmm. we got universal i mean and so when the agents divide up the town they very often ask producers like who do you have relationships with right you're either honest or you bullshit your way through and you're like yeah we know this guy and that we know guy. everybody like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we 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 did happen to have relationships at Universal. I think but, we got, um, we got anyways, Paramount, I'm yeah, pretty sure. What, what, what is relevant is that we got Universal and the Weinstein Company. Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we were able to pitch our half the town. These other producers were able to pitch their half the town. I don't think they had any success on their end, although I, I don't know that for sure. But on our end, we had Universal and Weinstein. And when you guys say you pitch, did you guys go with a writer? Or did you just pitch yes. to get to, to option? Great question. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. So the other side had a writer, like the producer's sister or something was going to write it. Okay. We were told like, yeah, you guys, you, you need you to- You should package this up more. Well, no, yeah, you should, <laughs> you should develop the pitch with a writer. So it's interesting. I'd been making 30 Rock at the time and I was friends with- bunch of people and I had made um, this small movie called Meet Bill Mm -hmm. with Jason Sudeikis and Kristen Wiig. They were both in it. We made it in St. Louis, Missouri. Mm. And so we'd all kind of lived together in a hotel for a little while. So I had these relationships with some of these, you know, cool kids back in New York. And Jason at the time was married to Kay Cannon. Kay called me, actually, I remember I was in Utah skiing Mm -hmm. and Kay called me to pitch me a movie that she wanted to potentially right called the Z list, I believe, which was um, a whole other pitch. Yeah. And I was like, great, great, cool, cool. Listen, um, so interesting that you called me. Uh, you like acapella, right? <laughs> and she was like, yeah, yeah, we had a whole joke on the show about acapella. And I was like, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Would you be interested in doing this thing? And she was like, maybe, sure. Like, you know, we were all fresh as daisies and didn't really know what we were doing. Sure. And it was kind of like, this will be fun. It's a lark. We all saw the same movie and that as you know is huge oh my god totally it's the whole game you know it's like we're all rowing in the same direction and everybody's on board so that's really what happened it's like we just had a meeting of the minds about how funny it was what it could be what it could look like and in the book you have to remember one of the chapters is about the university of oregon all-female group davisi mm-hmm. one of the first ICA champions the international collegiate championship of acapella ICA. ICCAs, Mm -hmm. they were the first all-female group. So that was something we were interested in, was like why the all-female group and how to go like boys versus girls, et cetera. And that was like early on the group we were going to kind of talk about. So once we kind of had this kind of flying by the seat of our collective pants agreement with Kay and Kay was 
interested, we we went about developing a pitch. Like she you, like came to our house in LA, and we sat around our dining room table and we worked we up a pitch. Worked and, up and, a little and she pitch was and she was working on it while she was in working New York, on, 30 on Thirty Rock. Rock. Long story short, we go into pitch after you know spending a little time developing what was an awesome. A really awesome pitch. It was good. Involved a pitch pipe. Uh, we started, started it by blowing a no, pitch stop. pipe. No, stop. And this was when pitches were live, guys. This was pre-COVID. Yes. Correct. Yes. We were in, You're the in the room with all the players. We Kay and I, Kay to her credit, sang. We <gasps> like sang a little bit in yeah. the room. I remember Kay, you know, kept on like let out with Lady Boner. She yeah, I have a Lady Boner for... Lady Boner. And uh, <laughs> I remember vividly... At Universal, we pitched it to Peter Kramer. Mm-hmm. He was like a mid to senior level executive, but Peter Kramer today is is president of production at Universal and is a big time guy and a good buddy of and ours. Yeah, to his credit, and, um, he bought this. And Peter, Peter went to Harvard, and so Peter turned out to be a, one of the perfect types of people to pitch right. it to. Right, he got his it. whole perspective. He well, he got it. His perspective is like Jesus Christ, these acapella. Yeah, I remember those guys, and and he, you know, got why like it's both funny. But also inspiring because these kids were talented and did kind of think that they were rock stars and, they, and of their own little college story. And, and by the way, I remember in the pitch telling the story of seeing Penn Six Five Thousand, seeing Rocket Man like better than Elton John, and being like, I'm a little bit in love with <laughs> lead singer. Like I think he's yeah. going to get laid by a lot of girls. Right. Right. And right. Peter and I were like the dudes who he was at Harvard. I was a Penn and we were the dudes who were like, God, these guys, like what oh, these, these girls think they're so cool. I don't get it. And <laughs> yeah, so like great. Peter understood and appreciated the comedy of it, mm-hmm. but also knew that, yeah, these kids are real and they could be, you know, there's a real music story and music yeah. movie. So that was Kramer. Kramer liked it enough to, to make an offer on it. And the other offer we had was from Weinstein or Mir- yeah, I guess it was Weinstein, yeah. which is relevant for, obviously, for the one reason of Harvey being Harvey, but um, another small little detail in the, world, in the lore of Pitch Perfect I love to tell is that Harvey ended up liking it so much, and as yeah. those of us who've been in the business and have ever dealt with him directly or, or in adjacent, you know, know that, like, as soon as he can't have something that he thinks he, right. he was entitled to, <laughs> he would just get pissed. So he started, of all things, chasing personally chasing pitch perfect and oh my god point, I remember this i remember but, very well and she at was with, yeah liz was with you at the met ball and harvey called her on her cell phone to yell at her no and he was, oh, he was in there person. he was there that's right there. he walked right up to that's me right i forgot about that at the met ball harvey weinstein wanted pitch perfect and it's just it's just amazing you know in in all in so many films or film franchises that go on to become this thing that no one ever expected there's always these kind of side off-ramp stories that like yeah what if and like <laughs> what if liz had just kind of folded to the pressure of harvey who was like you know made his usual bullshit threats and all that kind of stuff and what if we had sold the pitch to harvey weinstein at the weinstein company like a it probably never would have gotten made but if it had not made it would never have been what handled and treated in the way that Universal ultimately did. And it just never would have become the thing. Wait, so Basie, he he comes up to you sort of aggressively? He screamed at me in the middle of the Met Ball <gasps> with Georgina on his arm, who couldn't look me in the eye. She just looked away while he like yelled at me in the middle of this crowd. And then I went in the bathroom and cried. No, wait, <laughs> stop it. Yeah. I just couldn't believe it. It was so embarrassing. I was like looking around. And now I realize, of course, like it's so embarrassing for him. Do you know, like, right. I shouldn't have taken it that way, but I, I didn't, I just couldn't believe I was being berated by a grown man. I'm a grown woman right? You know what I mean? in my business, but again, like just, at this yeah. very fancy, important event where, you know, it's like, and it just was surreal. It's like, it was so surreal. This is like, this is, I mean, and, yeah, to Harvey's like, credit, maybe, maybe he was the genius that, that some would suggest he was. Maybe he saw what Pitch Perfect could be, could become. And that's why he wanted so badly. But at the time, it was, just, it was a surreal thing. Like, what is this dude's deal? Like, this right. is like an acapella pitch. Like, I can't, why does he care so much? So you sell it to Universal, obviously the right place. How does the development process go from there? Slowly. Slow with my last. <laughs> So, yeah, Kay went off to write, and she was on 30 Rock at the time, which is like a full-time job. And, right. And so she was writing kind of at night and on, on weekends or whatever. When she, she worked her time. tail off. Yeah, she worked hard, and I think Pitch Perfect was 
blessed with like the first draft that Kay came in with, which is really good. It was really Very funny. funny. Mm-hmm. Great, some great characters. Yep. We created, you know, a lot of great characters that still are, you know, to this day are part of the whole franchise. And sure. It was strong to the point where like most scripts that come into a studio after you sell a pitch, the studio reads it and you're like, okay, all right, right. we're moving on. Um, <laughs> but immediately people were like, this is really fun. And yeah. it was, it was a memorable early draft. No, holy. This is a surprise. What's your name? Fat Amy. Um, you call yourself Fat Amy? Yeah, so twig bitches like you don't do it behind my back. And had you guys just sort of let, once she turned in her outline or whatever, did you let her just go or were you checking in with her, reading pages? Yeah, we checked in a lot. I would say the big turn, frankly, in the development process was actually Peter Kramer saying, this is going to be for girls. So focus on the female characters because Mm. we had very much a balance, like two hander. We were definitely thinking like Michael Sarah is going to be, you know, the guy in the movie. It's going to be geek chic. Like that's what, you know, we were. Yeah. The pitch, the the kind of the early, early idea literally was at the end of super bad, Chris Mintz plots and, yeah. and, and Michael Sarah are going, are going to and, college, they're going to Dartmouth. Right. Like, oh my God. These guys we're like, it's these go guys in acapella. In acapella. <laughs> right. Um, and that would have made total sense. I mean. And it was also a lot of bring it on. We were really, that was mm-hmm. a big reference point for us. Right. So yeah. the, the idea that it was going to be a sports movie was baked in from the beginning too. It was always going to be kind of like bad news bears, but we definitely focused on the rivalry between the two groups and at the end of the day, Peter was like, we should just make the focus the girl group and then have the guys be the rebel, like more bring it on. Like, let there be a Kristen Dunst character. Then it shifted and it really became about the Bellas and the Bellas movie. Amazing. And bringing this back to an earlier question you had, at this point now, after we had done a draft or two, Glee was out in the world. Glee got announced. So another one of our favorite stories is... We went to we Passover our, Seder. Our, our, our annual Passover Seder, as we all, everyone does in Hollywood. And, <laughs> um, and at the time, there was a mutual friend who would go every year to the Seder, and he and I would kind of shoot the shit. He was a successful writer. Well, but, but I didn't. On I, Nip I, Tuck yeah. at the time. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm talking sure. to him, and you know, this is, again, before anyone really knew who Ryan Murphy was, and this is not Ryan Murphy. So I, I said to him, What's next for you guys? Because I guess if I recall, Nip Tuck was kind of ending. ending. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, we, uh, me and uh, Ryan, Ryan just sold. sold this uh, this pitch for our next show uh, to Fox. It's uh, it's called Glee. It's about a high school Glee club. Glee club. And I remember thinking to myself, like, good luck, dude. We just sold Pitch Perfect <laughs> at Universal. We're making that, like, next year. And uh, that guy was Brad Falchuk. Falchuk uh, oh, sure. Who is, Gwyneth's husband. Yeah, so we kind of got locked into what is happens all the time in this business, which is there is this successful TV show or the successful other film mm-hmm. and studio executives, not wrongly, are like, ah, mm. are we going to make that movie when people can watch the same thing for free on television? Oh, so it made it harder for you guys? Much for harder. Sure. We, got, oh, okay. we, we just kind of okay. got locked in this like Glee tractor beam, whereas like- You just have the movie version like, of Glee and we're like, no, 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 it's and then not you kinda, the same. You get locked into this, a little bit of this double-edged sword because it's like, oh, this area or an idea for a film looks really promising because Glee is so successful. But right. at a certain point, Glee is not going to be successful or, it, you know, Glee is going to end and, and or get canceled. Then they're going to say, now see, you know, the marketplace doesn't have an interest in that anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, right, right. So oh, that was yeah. like the big fear. Hate, we kind of hate that. We were running a, that gauntlet. There's a couple year period where we just kind of were treading water. More uh, importantly, I was asking the questions about how do I get this in the starting gate for you? What does that look like? Yeah. Really, the answer was we maybe needed outside financing. Mm-hmm. Like, how do we make this attractive enough to the studio? A co-pro. And I had made in the time, bef- I had made in the time um, <laughs> since selling the pitch, I made Slither, James Gunn's first movie, which was a universal release, but it was financed by Gold Circle Films. And Gold Circle had done My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Mm-hmm. It's run by this guy, Paul Brooks. Mm-hmm. 
And we talked to a few other people about yeah. maybe trying to like come in and co-fi or like how could we like just get even like money to like bring on a director and like right. really start packaging this thing, you know? Right. To his credit, Paul read it. I remember we met him at the W in Westwood where we happened to get married. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's where most big Hollywood meetings <laughs> <laughs> and um I remember we met him and he was like, I think it's really funny. <laughs> and he loved me for you know, we had a great relationship from Slither. He was like, I want to talk to the studio about it. Bringing on Paul was like the the sort of the One, rev in the engine. Yeah. Yeah. The other was Jason Moore. And then we got to attach um, Jason, yeah. We had seen Avenue Q on mm-hmm. Broadway and just like tonally felt so in the bullseye of what Pitch Perfect was and um Jason had not directed a film at that point. He directed nope. episodes of Dawson's Creek. Dawson's Creek. Mm. But Jason had, you know, was very extremely accomplished as he still is to this day in terms of Broadway and and, and development and like, you know, yeah. he's a great leader. And Jason, we didn't know this or certainly didn't appreciate it at the time, but Jason is just like a music savant and um, mm. Oh my god. Jason came on, certainly in my opinion, Jason is in many ways like the architect of all things pitch perfect. It's what it's what mm-hmm. the whole franchise became is what mm-hmm. Jason did mm-hmm. musically. Yeah, with the to music. elevate like we had a we had a great script. We had great characters. It was really funny. But what turbocharged Pitch Perfect, what made Pitch Perfect what it is, is like the whole music. And it's not, you know, there's been plenty of films that have had great music and obviously there's a lot of musicals, but it just was the notion of mashups and him saying, yeah, song like uh through some friends like bulletproof this, uh, yeah was like, like wasn't even barely out yet yeah, like da- yeah, got david guetta is doing this kind of thing and he kind of played it's like yeah, oh it's kind my of hot, god like, kind of clubs in ibiza and we're like what, mm-hmm. what? Yeah. <laughs> and uh jason just did all, all that stuff and um and, and well and he really and he brought in he brought in this guy great guy tom kitt who's a big yeah Broadway. sure guy yeah who had, um, done the green day uh musical, musical that yeah. we'd also seen yet and um part of this is we had so many sort of like new young faces in the movie mm-hmm. and Jason was adamant as we all knew we had to be about a rehearsal period where mm-hmm. we just had everything prepped. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think both Jason and I share this philosophy when it comes to directing, which is if you fail to plan, you should plan to fail. Mm-hmm. We knew that we couldn't fly by the seat of our pants when it came to like any of the musical numbers. We put together what we still to this day call acapella boot camp. We've all had it before everything. So we just made Bumper in Berlin, the Pitch Perfect series that's coming out on Peacock. And we still have to have mini boot camps, even with experienced people who are like, I got it. We're like, no, 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 <laughs> come in, you know. So how long was that? What were the intricacies of boot camp? Ooh, boot camp involves selecting the music. Mm-hmm. That's a huge part of it. We then take every song and break it down into acapella parts. I mean, I don't do that. We have an amazing team of people that do that. By the way, some of whom are in the book Pitch Perfect. That's how we found them. So that's, and again, that's another another thing that Jason did is he went out, you know, he convinced us that as the producers, like, we have to go hire the acapella specific arrangers. and And so the first person he brought in, was this guy, Deke Sharon, who's a, another great guy who's also become a friend. Deke Sharon is known in the, or at least certainly was known as the godfather. Of He's Acapella. made his life into his, acapella. Yeah, it's amazing. One of, one of his partners is another guy named Ed Boyer, who handles kind of the more technical side of yeah. recording and producing the songs. But regardless, the two of them take, you know, would take any song that we ultimately landed on and they they break it down and into then, all the musical parts, musical parts and, and then and, assign and it then. to our actors based on their voice parts oh my by the way God. that was part of the audition process if you can believe it was like well we still need a baritone you know well, <laughs> like, yeah. so everyone in both groups could sing yes yeah. everyone and they sang. sang their own they all auditioned they with their, their own stuff yeah with a, some version of a song i remember rebel sang lady gaga oh yeah. my god <laughs> yeah and she did all the percussion on her body which you can imagine was very funny. Yes, yes. But then, yeah, different people did different things, which is ultimately how we end up casting a lot of them because they were characters. And, like, uh, I remember Anna Camp came in, played the ukulele, and, mm-hmm. and sang something with the ukulele. Yep. Hanamay Lee, Hanamay uh, Lily, 
who is um, <laughs> the of, quiet one in the yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She she's Korean. She came in and turned her back to us. She, yes, and sang a song in all Korean. A Korean like, like weirdest, folk song. The weirdest thing in the world. And you're like, <laughs> it was so <laughs> weird. And we were like, we're in. We're 100. Yeah. percent You you obviously need to be in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know Kendrick famously um, I think Most people know. Uh, you know came. Tell the story though. Tell the story. She Anna came in. She'd flown in from another job or, or she was she was on the East Coast and flown in really and, late in the and, process and hadn't had a lot of time to prepare. And so she didn't really have a song. And, and Anna obviously is a very strong singer, uh, but she had had time in her mind to like really prepare mm-hmm. a true song. So she's just like, yeah, I kind of looked up this thing on the Internet. I found it's kind of cool. And, mm. and she and it was the cup song that she that two girls from Scotland, I believe, called Lulu and the Lampshades, did oh my god the, the cup song together, and they would pass cups back and forth. And, and Anna found that on on YouTube and 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 did it for us in the room. And you're just like, you know, it was it's amazing the the moment you kind of heard a cultural it. phenomenon. I mean, that's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and you know, to, to her credit, like she saw that and found it. And and, and I don't think it. she expected it would be in the no, movie. That was that was think, Jason. Then was like, let's yeah. just make that her audition. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't think anybody expected that. In the script, the character was singing I'm a Little Teapot. For the casting, is there any other sort of notable moments? Because you really did sort of... Ben Platt was there, amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of no- notable moments. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you really discovered so much talent. Ben, ben Platt walked in the room. Yeah. None of us knew who he was. I think He's, Mar- he's Mark Platt's he's Mark Platt's son, which we didn't realize. Who's a, who f- is a famous... Musical producer. Extraordinarily producer. successful uh, producer of many things. No- notably, you know, Wicked and... All, I mean, a million things. Um, Mark Platt is a legend. We didn't know who Ben was. I mean, Ben, I think, was like maybe 19 no, years old. No, he was 18. The, I remember 18, yeah, he walked he, in and he, we were like, so what's your story? And he's like, well, I'm going, I'm a just graduating college. high school and I'm going to college in the fall. And we were like, that's exactly this character. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And he was, you know, I don't, I, I don't imagine he had done much professional auditioning I, i'm sure he, i know that he did a lot of stuff in high school but uh you know he was green, totally green and he just had this thousand yard stare when he walked in the room where you're just like oh man that is the guy that's the like, guy he was just like deer in headlights fresh young just, yeah. and then, wide-eyed yeah. like and college then, and then he had this incredible <laughs> voice and you're like okay and then there he, he is that's and then the he guy. sang well of course ben went on to much success in dear evan hansen and he he killed that and was incredible I'd say the vast majority of actors uh, who played main roles in the film all had pretty memorable auditions and mm-hmm. and uh, singing. I remember Kelly came in. So we were auditioning for Alexis's role, who is like the sexy baby. And Kelly Jackal <laughs> came in and she sang and then she did an orgasm. And I was like so um, impressed with just how bold she was. And she wasn't exactly, she's almost like too cute to be like the super sexy Alexis Knapp character. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Casey, but she was an amazing singer. She was an, an actual acapella group. Okay. So she knew how the songs got broken down. She knew everything about acapella that you could possibly know. She's an incredible singer to this day. And she was just so bright and bold. And we were like, we need to fill out the group. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's bring her in. You know, she has no lines in the movie. <laughs> That's like the joke, right? Of her character. And right. Her right. and Shelly Regner's characters are that they're in the group, but they don't ever speak. They, I don't, you know, they had no, they were Shelly and Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, so good. But she was an absolute incredible singer and she was really bold. And so we, you know, that it was really fun to be able to reward a couple people who really came in and made made bold choices and were also just incredibly talented and fit into what we needed as we were filling out the puzzle of the group. The vast majority of actors who we ultimately cast in the film, like they were all there for a reason. Like Mm -hmm. Anna Camp was there, like Liz and I loved True Blood and Anna Camp Mm -hmm. had this in True Blood where she just was crazy and amazing. You know, uh, you know, we were huge workaholics fans. We're like, we Let's love. Just, can we bring, please bring, bring this, Adam Devine? Will he please come in? in? <laughs> and you know, and Adam, Adam, like uh, you know, is a total bro and got like the notice that he's to go on audition for this movie. And he's like thought it would like a lot of people. He's like, oh, is this a baseball movie? Like, I don't sing. <laughs> and uh, he kind of showed up, and I remember Adam, you know, coming in and doing his audition, and he just like totally owned it, and it was just kind of weird. Uh-huh. So many people were in there. I mean, Britney Snow from Harry. Yes. Ray, 
Um, you know, she felt like she was just like the perfect person for that role. Um, yeah. Just on down the line. Obviously, Rebel Rebel had kind of done that quick hitting thing in uh, Bridesmaids. Six, Bridesmaids, Bridesmaids, excuse me. Bridesmaids, yeah. And where she just was super weird. So she and Anna and I were all in what to expect when you're expecting. That's a little oh my that God. people forget. Yeah. So, and Rebel pre, pre, pre to pre pitch. To pitch perfect. Okay. Okay. And Rebel played my assistant yeah. in the movie. And Basie, did you just fall in love with her on what to expect? Like, did you get to know her? Well, we, we, I think we'd cast Rebel by the time we made the movie. Yeah. Um, I mean, Rebel, Rebel was for the role she's playing. She was the first person we cast in the film. She was a hundred percent undeniable. Um, excuse me, mm-hmm. but you guys are going to get pitch slapped so hard, your man boobs are going to concave. The smell of your weird is actually affecting my vocal cords, so I'm going to need you to scoot, skedaddle. Okay, so you're cast up, you've pre-recorded, you've gone through boot camp, which was painful, but absolutely necessary. Take me into production. Where did you guys shoot? What was the process? We We shot shot in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, geez. Our production headquarters was in an old abandoned like Macy's or something, right? Yeah, it was an abandoned uh, building. And when we first showed up, there were just like dead cockroaches all over the floor because <laughs> they clearly fumigated the building like right before we arrived there. The, be- the Bellas and the Troublemakers do not know how fast we and hard we worked to make that space yeah. like livable for them. And by the way, we had to bring in a dance floor and the mirrors and all of that to create a studio for them. And we built a recording studio inside the building. Because that was part of boot camp. So you would go, you'd learn your parts, you'd practice, then you'd come in, you'd do your recordings, then you'd go to choreography rehearsal. You know, all the time that we're out scouting locations and figuring out where we're going to shoot everything and working on the script and, you know, everything that you need to do to prep a movie was all happening. And I also remember that then there was like a hurricane. Remember? And like the whole place flooded. Road was flooded. The lobby started flooding. Like we were like, we got to get everybody out of here. Yeah, I actually got it. Ended up getting quite cold mm-hmm. um, towards the latter part of the shoot. When, you know, like when we shot the riff off. The riff um, off in was, the pool, everyone was freezing. It was freezing. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. Okay. So wait, I because I, I want to get to the riff off. I think that's one of the most the greatest scenes. Um, so you're you're prepping. It's like kind of hellacious, dirty, but you're getting through it. And now take me to the actual shoot of it all how is that going is everyone getting along is it i mean it's a huge ensemble that in and of itself feels complex it was like a it was party a party and it was like, having it was, so much it was fun. camp and those guys all they i, I, mean, I think to to this day if you talk to many of them like they they have very fond memories and and but because the guy it was the guys and the girls it just was like a very well balanced environment the guys in particular the troublemakers went bonkers. <laughs> Those had, guys were partying at, like, at, at, well, at also, LSU. And, well, Adam was like famous yeah. from workaholics yeah. amongst the LSU crowd, a, right? And, so, like, and, and then subsequently the actual LSU football team. Yeah. And <laughs> that when we were shooting uh, Pitch Perfect 1 at LSU was the year or one of the years that LSU was the number one ranked team in the country. So like to be at LSU at that time, it, you know, those guys, uh, they were host, having so much yeah, fun. It was, it was tailgating out on, you know, so the, they would just like hit up frat parties or what? Like just go party with the football I don't team? want to speak to what they did or didn't do, but, uh, <laughs> we don't want they, to speak to that. They had a good time. They had a good time. <laughs> Everyone and, was having fun. And New Orleans. No comments. New Orleans was an hour and a half away and <laughs> got it. Got it. That is we only cool. had to bail one person out of jail. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> we'll talk about that uh, later. <laughs> which was lucky. We were, we thought it'd be a lot actually, higher number. Actually, actually yeah. I don't think we, I think we he, didn't. We sent a producer to do. We sent think, somebody yeah. to bail him out. Yeah. Um, oh my god, that's amazing. That was that was environment. It was it was pretty crazy. We had a baby at the time. That's right. So we, I didn't go. In. I never yeah. went out with yeah. any. I was home with my baby. I want to talk about the musical sequences just like a little bit more in depth and being there on the day because it's like those those magical moments in movies. And so start with the riff off. First of all, that weird empty pool location. How did that? happen and then 
on the day, did you realize how awesome it was? Like were, when you were when you were shooting, were you like, this is going to kill? Why were we shooting in an empty swimming pool? It was because <laughs> like we were on LSU campus and we needed like some cool space. Visually shoot. interesting. But 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 also that we could shoot at night. That was, you know, LSU. Like, again, we just, no one really thought this stuff through. Oh, as it turns out, you actually can't shut down major parts of the college campus. So there was nowhere to fucking shoot. Yeah. <laughs> So we're, and we're like, well, we're doing this big thing called a riff off where we're going to have, I don't, you know, something like 30 actors in this yeah. space. Mm-hmm. We're all going to be singing back and forth and we needed to have space for the camera to move and all this. And there just was, there was very few places. The person who should get, who, who gets credit for this, his name is Jeff Levine. Oh yeah. Who worked at Gold Circle. And I'm not sure where Jeff is these days. Jeff is like an old kind of guard producer and Jeff I remember him coming back excitedly like, yeah, we just, we, we, yeah, there's like an empty swimming pool. It'd be amazing. And we're like, what, what, an empty, what are you talking about, dude? And yeah, there was an empty I swimming don't remember pool how, house. because someone says in the movie, like the acoustics are good or something. Mm-hmm. I think Kay like wrote that after it was like, we're oh shooting this in a pool. I totally <laughs> buy that, by the way. I'm like, yeah, yeah the acoustics so, but, in an empty and, swimming and then, pool. Although somewhat weirder, I mean, I guess it makes sense because this is uh, Louisiana, but like the pool was outdoors. So then it became, well, we're shooting outdoors at night in this like big empty concrete space. It, that basically became a refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. And no, I don't think I hadn't heard of most people like, well, actually, Louisiana in uh, October, December, November, whenever yeah. we were sh- I think it was around November, like actually gets really, really cold. Mm-hmm. Certainly at night. So it was. Really cold. Freezing. Everyone was cold. Okay. Um, the Yo Diggy, that's all. That was Jason. He picked that, right? Mm-hmm. No diggity. But everything else Tom Kitt had worked with, you know, we got sort of what we call an easy clear list from our music supervisors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We still work with um, Julia Michaels and Julianne George. What's an easy clear list? Thanks. Easy clear is like you go to the record labels, the companies, the guy, you know, and you go like, okay, give us stuff that'll all clear for under $20,000, right? Like what's a bunch of songs that you can, like most favored nations across the board, we need 10. And here's the other key to it is we only need publishing, right? We don't need masters. And that is really a big key to how we're able to afford things in Pitch Perfect. Musically, is we don't need, ever need a master because we... Right, you were re-recording everything. We're re-recording the whole thing. Got it. Mm-hmm. So we only need the publishing. And we would get these easy clear lists. And it's, again, just a giant puzzle. So there's 150 songs on here. We create this rule that one song it has to you gotta pick up with using a word from the song, right? To create the next thing. Yes. So it was like, here you go, Tom Kit. Like, can you figure out oh my by God. the way, match the keys? Cause you have to remember this. Like you can't go from a minor key to a major key. Like you have to actually like musically make it work as well. It has to flow together beautifully. And so it's a huge And on top of that huge puzzle. You have to tell story story while you're doing within it. the riff off. Right. Right. Different moments. So, like you know, Jess, for instance, like, like Jesse, yeah, Jesse stepping forward and singing at Becca. And like, who, ooh, they're going to get a romance. Yeah. And, you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then, you know, and then her and then Becca stepping forward and, and doing her solo and realizing, oh, the girls kind of like think it's kind of cool when I do this thing. And yeah. so you're telling all this story. But that, but you know, that was based. So the riff off came from, it was a combination. Kay and I in our respective, like, theater arts nerd circles from college, right, had always done, I'd always done Mm, mm Hootenannies. So you go to the Hootenanny and everybody gets like a song book and it's just like somebody's on the piano and it's like, we're just going to go through and it's all going to be like everyone's singing together and who's singing what, whatever. And, you know, who ends up stepping forward and taking a solo and it's a Hootenanny. Okay. And that was like the impetus behind like, let's get these guys all singing together. And also we wanted to acknowledge that a college campus, typically at least ours and Mm -hmm. Cornell, and you know, there's more than one group. Right. And like they all compete, but they're also all pals mostly, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like you're Mm -hmm. in the same circle. These are become your, your friends. These are the, these are the sororities and fraternities of that world. So how do we make it feel like collegiate in a way? And the riff off was the way for us to acknowledge that and the party that they have after like the auditions, which was, again, that was how it worked at Penn. Everybody, you go to the auditions, you do like one thing, and then each group goes back and they all decide who's going to get what, you know, all the older, the seniors and juniors. 
decide which freshmen are going to get put into which groups. But you guys, I mean, honestly, it, I can't really think of that many college films that really kind of nail it or that are beloved. And this really, you guys did manage to sort of nail a certain quality of, of college life, which is like just another achievement of the film. It's funny yeah. how many 12 year olds are like, is that what college is going to be? And they're really excited <laughs> that my go to college is. Like, by the way, we pride ourselves on, we were just saying it the other day. No one in any of the movies has ever gone to class. <laughs> yeah, you've never seen anyone. That's class. so true. <laughs> never seen anyone. <laughs> There's like class. the DJ booth, but that's that's it. That's the <laughs> no, no, no. Um, There's a dean. We have a dean somewhere. It's, it's like Charlie Brown. There's like no adults anywhere. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> so just take me through the final sequence, which also is just one of the most epic. I think for me, just watching it over, I was just like weeping and it got the goosebumps and all those things. And again, like as you're shooting it you've done so much prep do you just know that you're you've nailed your finale like you're behind camera you're at monitor and you're just like oh that we've got it we like we nailed it I remember when we shot the wide so I could see the whole thing I remember thinking in the wide shot that they had killed it that it was great I mean you know you're listening to the music like live because everybody's everything's getting played and they're doing you know, they're all, <gasps> die, yeah. you know, they're huffing. Oh my God. So They've laid it all out there. You know, I, I definitely felt like we were me. I remember feeling this way <laughs> when we were making what had American summer. I felt mm-hmm. the same way when we, when we were making pitch, which was, it was culty. It was mm-hmm. niche. It was like the humor was pretty specific. You're something special. You could just felt like nerds who stayed home on Saturday nights and like watched Saturday Night Live were gonna appreciate what we were doing, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That we were making a movie not for jocks. You know, I don't know how else to put it, but like not, you know, you're making movies for for the like indoor kids. Yeah, (laughs) totally. And and that they were gonna really appreciate the these moments, you know? I, I would say in the finale, Jason knew that he wanted to open that scene with another group performing at the, the competition championship. So the word went out amongst uh, the acapella community. I think we had community. A, sure. We had Deke and Ed, like you know, all, all their, all their people. Oh my God. Whoever, whoever basically like literally whoever can get down here first, <laughs> we're putting in this movie. And, uh, and I'm sure it was a little, that happened to Pitch Perfect too. But, well. um, <sighs> Basically, uh, this group of guys, I'm pretty sure they're from UVA. Yeah. They got in like an old beat up bus and like they a van. Drove, van. They drove down from, like overnight from, from Virginia down to Louisiana overnight and the bus broke down and they weren't, it was Stop. a question. Make it on, you know, it's just like, you know, of course, of course the, the van broke down. But yeah, they, but they up, made it. They made it. They made it. Yeah, those, yeah. Those, those, those guys that the finale opens on performing, singing the final countdown, like those guys are in the actual acapella group from. I believe UVA at the time. And that's so awesome. That is so awesome. Okay. So you guys get into the edit or is it come together pretty, pretty easily? Like are, are there major notes? Are you happy? No, no. I actually, I I do remember that we moved an entire section of the movie at one point, got moved into the middle of the movie, right? We switched up. We switched up a whole sequence of events at a certain point. Did it go back or did it stay? No. So we switched it and we, it stayed switched. Oh my God. You have to tell us what. Uh, Yeah. I forget exactly what, which. There's like a whole middle section though that we moved. You know, one of the lessons, um, we actually were just talking about this uh, yesterday in a separate Pitch Perfect meeting um, (laughs) that will remain uh, confidential for the time being. But um, we were just talking yesterday about how, you know, the studio impetus and pressure always to like have as much airtight plot as, you know, all the plot has to be so logic driven. And this is something any, you know, almost every producer has dealt with at one point or another during development is just having the kind of plot machinations starting to just overwhelm the story and the characters. And so often it doesn't really matter. And unless like, you know, uh, an airtight Unless you're making thriller. glass onion, yeah, glass onion. Right, right. <laughs> don't need, like the plot to totally work. You so know? like, yeah. So in pitch perfect one in our development, there was, Oh you know, yeah. If you went back and read the script. There was just a lot of pressure for very reasonable reasons to like have everything kind of lining up and have different characters motivated and active. And, mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. and so if you go back and watch pitch perfect, the entire sequence of where Becca 
She goes to jail. And in doing so, she's disappointed her father, and there's like some stakes to that, and that she was maybe going to get thrown out of school. I don't even remember what it all was. She couldn't go to L.A. because he did yeah, that right. any longer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But in order to get to that point, we had to like motivate her character, the, the Becca character, to want to get in a fight. And you just had mm-hmm. to kind of back out of like why all that happened, and it turned into right. just right. a bunch of moving parts that when you watch the movie today, you're like, well, I didn't care about any of that stuff. No, <laughs> totally. It's I mean, totally it's like, irrelevant. Show, show me the singing. And, and you're the, like, and the I want, jokes. and the sisterhood yeah. and like the liveliness of it and the scrappiness and, and, and the like, you know. And the, just yesterday in this, in this separate development meeting, like Liz was making the point that, you know, part of like the unique pitch perfect DNA and, and is that there just isn't a, a level of scrappiness and a level of absurdity that kind of goes into pitch perfect that, if you question too much of it, none of it totally makes like, sense. And I that's remember why it's funny and weird. Yeah, and- I remember literally sitting in a meeting with the studio executives going, but why do people do acapella? Mm-hmm. And you're like, why do people do fucking anything? What are you talking about? <laughs> like, I, yeah. We're not making a whole movie about the psychology behind somebody who's like, I think I'll join an acapella group. Why would I do that? You know what I mean? It's like. You're 20 years old. You do shit because, like, your friend's like, you want to do this thing? And then you're like, yeah. yeah, sure. You know, like, that's it. It doesn't need more explanation than that. It's a great lesson as a storyteller, too. Like, people are always like, well, this thing seems so coincidental that these two people meet. And I'm like, that's every film that's ever happened. <laughs> No story happens without some coincidence of like a meet cute or a I'm on the same train as this person or we cross paths at whatever. Like that is life. We don't make movies about somebody who doesn't meet the person that day, <laughs> you know, who didn't go to the fair and meet the acapella nerds. Like, what are you talking about? So, are you interested? Sorry, it just is pretty lame. Ah, excuse me? Okay, so the edit comes together. Do you guys test it? We had a really good first test, as yeah, I recall. Like a really know, positive, like, oh, people like this. <laughs> it was Well, it was funny. Um, so, you know, Pitch Perfect 1, like Universal kind of, they grudgingly made it. We actually skipped a whole kind of deve- uh, early development story about how ultimately like what got the studio to kind of in effect green it. We were actually trapped in this glee tractor beam, as I alluded to before. And mm-hmm. it was kind of like we were going in circles where we couldn't kind of get traction to really move forward in letting the studio allowing us to start casting and, and hiring like, you know, line producer and get a budget. And that kind of, yeah. At one point, Peter Kramer said to his credit, he said, you guys should cut together a sizzle reel. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. To capture the essence of what this movie can be. Home video back then was yeah. big, too. Um, <laughs> so you just need to remind the decision makers about, like, how great this could be and how much fun this is. How much and fun And so is. we did cut together this, this mm-hmm. sizzle reel, which is, you know, for those who don't know, is, like, you're, you take clips of other movies, scenes from other movies that kind of capture the energy and it's like a trailer we, for the script. Yeah. And we, we, and, and you feature music and comedy and, you know, this is, this is what this movie could be. About. I remember so we, we had, that. we had clips from Van Wilder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Among and others. We, yeah. I mean, as you might imagine, like, yeah, yeah, a There's lot a of, lot like, of college Reynolds, movies, a lot of Ryan, Ryan Reynolds and Will Ferrell. Um, <laughs> sure. All yeah. Over, <laughs> all over the lot. So, um, we, we did cut together this great sizzle reel and then it became like, okay, we got to schedule this time to get in front of, the uh you know the execs donna and right. head of marketing um and and that kind of thing and that of course then also turned into like a a two month long waiting process so anyways long story short we end up going in on monday and that monday it was like 11 a.m on monday and the weekend before was that friday uh was bridesmaids <gasps> and oh universal God. had no idea that bridesmaids was going to do what it did. I'm sure they, you know, they tested, I'm sure they knew it was going to do well, but nobody saw Bridesmaid coming. And in, in certainly in the way that it did. And right. we just, I remember we going in there that Monday morning and, and they were just like, giddy. They were literally like giggling and laughing because they were so <laughs> stunned by 
Bridesmaids. So and happy. we were like, we're like, well, we them. have a yeah, movie with like funny girl girls. Movie. Yeah, we got a funny girl movie, and this time they sing, and they're like, <laughs> but but even you look at the posters, it's like a line of women bridesmaids. Pitch for, I mean, I never made that That's comparison, but that accident. is so not an accident. And, uh, yep. but it, you know, I just, I, I love telling that story. I forgot that happened it just, yeah, until right now. It just yeah. speaks to, you know, I think a lot of people think of luck in a far more romantic and dramatic way. And oftentimes it, it comes down to stupid things like, well, so-and-so schedule, like had to change and he or she they had to be in, in New York or, or Europe, you know, that thing. And, and, you know, if we had gone in when we wanted to, we would have gone in three weeks before bride, Bridesmaids and maybe, maybe they the would, have would have been totally. Um, so, you know, we look, I always say like you have to do the work so that when the luck comes, you're ready right. to go. And we had totally. done all of that. So we were prepared for their yeah. yes. And we obviously showed up to that meeting like and put our best foot forward. But we also happened yeah, to go to yeah. the the meeting on the right day when everybody's in the right mood to say yes, you know? Oh my God. That's so awesome. I love that story, but it tested well. It did. It tested, it tested well. Yeah. 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 I, I think at that point, Universal, I think just like kind of was tickled by the film. Yeah. I don't think any of us, but certainly the studio had any sense of like, how is this going to do? Is this a wide release? We don't, you know, and we ended up platforming it. Yeah. Um, we back, didn't even wide um, release it. Back in the day, like but, so, uh, how many screens did you open on? Do you guys remember? I, I, I do. I, um, it was somewhere between. I'm going to say between 400 and 600 screens. Okay. Wow. And what happened was that early platform release, which was a week ahead of the wide release, went bonkers. Yeah. Like it went. The you know, Thursday night number the, was the, really the good. Numbers were huge. Oh, oh. First 400, and yeah. to the point that like the head of marketing called us like wow, do you see those numbers? And and I didn't really have any frame of reference. I was like, wow, yeah, was that, that, that was good. And he's like, <laughs> dude, that was amazing. That, that's crazy. That's incredibly good. You know, we then opened wider the following week. And, you know, the movie did well. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people forget Pitch Perfect 1 didn't go crazy theatrically. What I think that initial limited release showed is that, like, there was a hardcore, passionate group of fans right. for this type of yeah, but there was no marketing for it. Like, you know, they were barely running the trailer. Like, there's nothing. And, you know, it did. I think they were very happy with it, um, if what it was. But, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, I think it did domestically about $60 million. Mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. The budget was a really, really good number. In today's theatrical climate, you're like, oh, my God, I'd love to have a $60 Can't even believe it. Totally. Yeah, at the time, a $60 million release, you're like, nah. I mean, no, we, we were, definitely. We were thrilled. Yeah, and that film totally, totally overachieved. But it wasn't like. Yeah. It wasn't. It grew, like, this is a, it grew in the aftermarket, yeah, right? It, so I mean, as soon as, like, young 10-year-olds could watch it 50 times in a row. Right. On their TV at home is yeah. when that movie really and really took off and it set up the model for what the franchise kind of became which was was really awesome powers it was awesome powers all that's you know, right awesome forget powers the first awesome powers what right actually did about 50 million dollars and i've never yeah those in the 90s um so i don't know what those numbers equate to but you know it, it did roughly what pitch perfect did everyone thinks back you, you know you mentioned awesome powers people that people assume that that first movie was huge it was it was a smash right home video right. is when people started watching it every bro well, was going around you know, doing yeah baby and all that's that stuff. what it was so it's how it became part of the cultural conversation right yeah. so cups became mm-hmm. huge and right. then the whole aka this aka that i remember like target wanted to put out shirts that were like aka yes or aka excuse me right. aka excuse me was like a big thing aka excuse me and so that, you know, and you just realize like, oh man, we're like, we're in the lexicon. That's interesting. Yeah. That means that it's really, it has a hold on people Com- in the way that you pray. Like I like that comedy is going to do. And you know what I mean? When I say, when I was watching it, there were just moments where I was like, this is very cult, you know, I, I call myself fat Amy. So you, so twig bitches don't do it behind my back. I was like, yeah, done like that. That's really, everyone loves going to love that line. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, it was moments like that when we were shooting where I thought like this will be cult. I didn't think it would be huge, but I thought comedy people who like funny movies are going to understand what we were attempting to do, you know? Right. But you know, the best part about pitch the whole time is that we collaborated with people who all got the sensibility of the movie. 
So from, you know, us partnering up with Kay on the script to bringing in Jason to Paul, who like just loves funny movies, you know, everyone yeah. got what the sense of humor was that we were going for, the scrappiness that, you know, I think Jason obviously elevated all the music, but like in right. terms of making a, a big hearted comedic movie with hard laughs. That was what we all were trying to do. And we told Universal we were going to do that. And then we were able to deliver it. Then they're able to market it. And then, you know, you yeah. have a success. Like that's. And then you have a franchise. I say this because it's actually really, really hard to do. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Meaning it's hard to yep. pick all the people where the brain mm-hmm. trust is like thinking the same mm-hmm. thing. In sync. Them, totally. You know, totally. There's some often somebody off to the side, you know, and it, and by the way, all the department heads, people who read it that were like, this is really funny. We're like, you're the person, you know, there were people that read it that were like, I don't really get it. And we're like, bye. <laughs> you know? You're not the person for us. So that was a big part of it. You guys, I love you so much. I mean, there's so much more to discuss in that you guys have, you know, you created a franchise and you continue to, to make new pieces of material from it, including your show Bumper Goes to Germany? Bumper in Berlin. Bumper in Berlin. <laughs> Bumper in Berlin. Uh, maybe, Sorry. Maybe, maybe. Is your title better, is Danielle? Bumper Goes to Germany better? <laughs> It's not quite but as, that, but quite that, as alliterative as, as ours. No, it's not as alliterative. Streaming exclusively on Peacock. Which is, which is a, a streamer. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's so much more to discuss. I'm so incredibly grateful. I love you guys so much. This was so fun. We'll just have to do it again, okay? Oh, yeah, we'll talk Pick about it up. It's uh, perfect, too. Well, you'll, you'll see how many people stream this, and then we'll decide if we ever need to talk about this again. <laughs> <laughs> So Vex, what'd you think of that episode? That was so much fun. I was like a high school kid, like watching her favorite actors just talk about, about I know. stuff. It was just, oh my gosh, like give me popcorn and we could listen to them all day. Listening to a husband and wife team is also hilarious. Yeah. They're just like talking over each other. And <laughs> she's eating her sandwich. But, and, but they were so used to it. Yeah. They just, that's just how they are. And no. it was very cute. They are. They're so smart and so fun and, um, I look at them as a real model of a producing duo. And I think there's a lot of people in this industry, actors who decide to be producers. I've just noted over the years that a lot of those actors slash producers sometimes don't do the work. And I think the thing that I've really noted about Elizabeth is that she rolls her sleeves up and, and she's in there and she's finding the writers and she's digging into story and, and Max is literally on set every day. And I think it's so impressive because that's not always the case with a lot of actors production companies right that's true because a lot of times they don't have to do that work yeah they can very easily not and it can be just kind of a star vehicle for them yeah and it was funny because some of the things that they did in producing this movie reminded me of things that I've seen you do over the years Mm -hmm. like when they went to see Avenue Q and they were like who directed this because this is this is in the tone of exactly the film that we're trying to make. And then they approached that director and he ended up directing the film. It reminded me of when you were casting Harriet with Deborah Martin Chase and the two of you went to go see Cynthia Revo in The Color Purple. Yeah. And you said, this is our Harriet. And you met with her backstage and she was Harriet. The thing I love about them is they really, they thought outside the box, you know, to go and pursue the director of Avenue Q is probably not the first instinct of Hollywood producers, right? You want to sort of stay inside your sandbox and, and sort of choose from the directors that are being pitched to you. And I think it was sort of so innovative of them to go to New York, watch that show and just really sort of grab him before anyone else thought to do that. So I thought that was a really clever approach. And I don't even think they realized what value they were getting from that, right? I mean, I think it seems clear to me that Jason brought a whole element to the musical component of the film that elevated it in such a way that they probably hadn't even thought of, right? All the mashups and the choreography, I mean, it's the stuff that really makes that film sing, no pun intended, 
And I think it was really Jason's influence and experience in Broadway that allowed them to execute on that. I agree. And I think that because of his experience in Broadway, that's where the scrappiness came from. Yeah. And also the fact that they came from their mindset was of the indie producing world and not yeah. studio producing world. And so they approached it in a very scrappy manner too. Yeah. I think in a way to me that, and no offense to any Glee fans out there, yeah. Glee doesn't. Like Glee yeah. feels like the polished studio, right. poppy Hollywood version of, right. of this same world. And Pitch Perfect feels much more grounded and authentic and genuine, even though it's fun and Hollywood and obviously the stuff would never happen in real life. There's sure. just, there's an authenticity to it that I think Glee lacks, which is why I think this franchise has held up so well over the years. And yeah. I can't, I actually could not believe that this movie was made 10 years ago because it does hold up so well. It could have been made last week. <laughs> uh, I, I totally agree. And I think the thing that, I am not even sure Max and Elizabeth are acknowledging is that all that work they did on the script for months and months and months and months clearly shows. I mean, like those characters were well-developed. Those jokes were sharp, you know, like the work that Kay and Elizabeth did early days, I think really provided the house that like the whole franchise could be built from. You Right. Right. Like they created all these amazing characters that people could really dig into. And so I sort of felt like, you know, Elizabeth was sort of arguing that like, you know, you don't need to have a reason for people to meet all the time. And I totally agree with that. But by the same token, it felt like they really did the work on that script. And that's why it really worked as well as it did. So sometimes that's just like the way beautiful, successful films come together, right? Like you're not even aware of all the work and all the sort of happy accidents that happen to make a film great. How about that story about bridesmaids? That was crazy to me. And and the fact that they found Rebel Wilson uh-huh. right before Bridesmaids was coming out. Totally. And she had such a moment. And like they said, she was kind of the only person in Hollywood who could have played that part. And yeah. that part and her role in Bridesmaids became so iconic. Yeah. And I guess some, sometimes it really is just fate. The fact yeah. that Bridesmaids set them up in, in this way and also... If we were producers and that came out, we'd be like so scared, right? Totally. Um, so it's sometimes it just is, it's, you never know. All right, guys. Well, that was awesome. That was great. Um, we're really enjoying doing these podcasts. So please keep listening. Make sure to subscribe. Yep. Follow us on social media. Our Instagram is at Stay Gold Features. DM us if you are liking the shows, if there's any producers you want us to interview, any films you want us to do. And leave us reviews. And thank you for listening. We'll catch you next week. Stay gold. Stay gold.